Glory Cloud Podcast, Episode 60. Stay tuned for more discussion of Kingdom Prologue this week. Welcome back to another episode of the Glory Cloud Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Cahi, and I'm joined by our co-host, Charles Lee Irons. Welcome back, Lee. Hello, Chris. It's great to be with you again. Well, I'll just run through our regular housekeeping before we get started. Uh, please do visit our show notes page over at meredithkline.com slash podcast. There you will find all of the resources that we list and mention during the episode. Plus, we've started to list the exact page numbers of Kingdom Prologue that we cover during the episode. So if you're reading along with us, you can know exactly which parts of Klein's text that we're talking about in that particular episode. Uh, thank you again to all of our generous donors. We really do appreciate your help in keeping this podcast going and for your encouragement. If you aren't able to donate money, you can still help us out by giving us a five-star rating on iTunes and by subscribing to the show on your favorite podcatcher. Those two things, the ratings and the subscriptions, really help us rise to the top and stand out to people who are looking for good theological content in their podcasts. If you are able to donate money and you would like to help us cover the monthly cost of hosting the audio files, you can go to meredithkline.com slash podcast and you will find a donate button on the right hand side of the page. This week, we are on to a new section of Kingdom Prologue, beginning on page 66, entitled Theocratic Kingdom Commission. And today we're going to start to get into some of the cultural mandate. So looking forward to that discussion. Yeah, so this is a, a really meaty section of Kingdom Prologue, and there's a lot of good stuff in here. Uh, just to remind people where we're at in uh, the structure here, this is chapter three of uh, the section dealing with the uh, covenant of works or the covenant of creation. And Klein is using the ancient Near Eastern treaty structure to outline his treatment of that. So uh, chapter one was parallel to the preamble of the ancient Near Eastern treaty in which the suzerain identifies himself. Uh, chapter two was uh, based on the historical prologue section, and now we're in chapter three, which is parallel to the stipulations section of the suzerain vassal treaty. And just like the uh, suzerain vassal treaties that have both basic and specific stipulations, Klein also uh, subdivides this chapter into two parts. So the basic uh, requirement of the covenant of creation we dealt with last time, uh, which is the imitation of God principle and loving God with all of our heart. And so now we're coming to the specific stipulations, which is the cultural mandate. So there's a lot packed into Genesis 128, right? Where we mm -hmm. see God tell Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Genesis 128, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And we could also tie in a verse in the next chapter, Genesis 2, verse 15, that ties in with that. It says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Okay. And it's not accidental that this is situated in God's fiat fulfillment pattern that we've been seeing uh, mm -hmm. in chapter one, where God says, let there be, and lo and behold, it was. And mm -hmm. um, uh, seems that God is using his human creatures to do the fulfillment part of his, his fiat there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. 
uh, in the fiat section, God addresses the heavenly council, uh, in which he discusses his plan of creating an image bearer with royal glory, just like the council has. And then in the fulfillment section, God addresses man and then repeats the plan to them. So verse 28 is parallel to, that's in the fulfillment, but it's parallel to verse 26 in the fiat uh, section. Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. It's almost the same wording. Um, although I think the difference is that it doesn't say be fruitful, multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. But it does have the rest of it about exercising dominion. Okay. So the, the point that Klein is bringing out from that is that uh, God is the great king. And he is seated on his throne addressing the heavenly council. And in the fiat section, he's saying, let's make someone in our image who has the same royal dominion and authority that we have, that, that God has in the midst of the heavenly council. So that means that in the fulfillment section, when God addresses man and gives him the mandate, that means that it's a royal mandate. Just as God is the great king, man is the vassal king. And another way of saying that is he's the image of God. Image and vassal king are uh, co-relative concepts. And so the cultural mandate, therefore, is a royal mandate to exercise dominion over the earth in God's name and under God's authority as a vice regent under God. Okay. So we don't encounter the verb to rule here like we do with some of the animals, but I mean, you do get with subdue and dominion, uh, especially being made in God's image, you still get that, uh, that Royal dimension to it. Right. Okay. So, um, there are a couple of aspects to this mandate that God gives to his human creatures. Um, and the first of those is procreation, that they're to be fruitful and that there should be more human creatures. Yeah, that's pretty obvious, right? Be mm -hmm. fruitful and multiply. It's a, a basic thing, and it's easy to kind of overlook that. And I think that uh, Klein draws our attention to it to say, look, this is really the most important aspect of the cultural mandate. And this is one of the key things that distinguishes man from the angels. Uh, the angels are not a race of beings that procreate, but man is a race. And so there's this genealogical process that continues throughout history. In fact, that's kind of what the, the fact that there are gene, that there are generations that follow one after the other is sort of what creates history itself. And uh, Klein even says that um, that's why the genealogies are so important in the Bible. In fact, genealogies are sort of the the first case of history writing. That's what history is, is, hmm. well, so-and-so had a son and, and then they had a son and so on and so on. And so that's a very significant part of man's uh, character and calling and his, his purpose. God made him to, to procreate and to reproduce that image. Uh, I, I really enjoy the way Klein puts it on page 69. He, he talks about how um, Adam and Eve uh, were different in this respect from the angels who are created a host, but are not a race. Mm -hmm. Man is created not a host, but one pair, a male and female, one flesh in their marriage union, who by multiplying themselves become a host that is also a race. Mm -hmm. This vital genealogical process is the central motif of human history. Man himself is the chief end product of human culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that last statement is uh, insightful too, that man himself is the chief product of human culture, because that's going to tie in with the, um, when, when we get to after the fall, where, how does this cultural mandate 
uh, get picked up by Christ as the second Adam. And, um, that's, that's what Christ is doing is he is reproducing himself that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, Romans eight twenty nine, And so it's this idea of reproduction that is so important. And, and, you know, I mean, when you think about the new creation fulfillment of the cultural goal, the cultural mandate, the primary purpose, the primary endpoint is a glorified humanity. Yes, there's a, a recreated glorified creation, the new creation, but that's simply the environment for a new humanity, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven for from God, like a bride adorned for her husband. So it's the people and this whole emphasis on, you know, first Peter two, that Christ is the living stone, the foundation stone, but we are being built up, uh, as living stones ourselves, uh, into a holy temple. So Christ's people, the church is the ultimate goal that he is, he is forming for himself as he fulfills the the primary purpose of the cultural mandate in the redemptive mode. Wow. So not even something that we produce, it's we, we ourselves as we are mm-hmm. conformed to the mm-hmm. image of Christ. Yeah. It's amazing. Okay. So that's the first aspect. Um, and so the second aspect comes in the, the second half of Genesis one twenty eight, and that's the subduing of the earth. Mm-hmm. I love the yeah. Hebrew word there, the kibosh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> to put the kibosh on it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, kibosh means to subdue and or to bring into subjection, mm-hmm. and it has the connotation of, of course, we're talking pre-fall here, so <clears throat> there's no sense of bringing an enemy into subjection yet at this point, but still there is this idea of, of, um, advancing the reign of God and man's dominion over a environment, over a creation that, um, may have some degree of resistance and it needs to be, um, taken into, um, it needs to be conquered in some way, um, not in a destructive way, but it needs to be brought under the authority of man. It's not yet under man's authority, at least not all of it. And so that's man's task is to subdue the earth. So just as a brief example, in in my backyard, we've got lots of blackberry vines and bushes. And if we don't stay on top of those things, they just grow everywhere. So we need to be trimming them so that they're not Mm -hmm. overtaking our entire backyard. Yeah. And I think that what we're seeing in Genesis one is that, yeah, there still would have been blackberry bushes in the garden. They still would have needed subduing and managing and pruning. Yeah. Pruning, managing. Those are good terms. Right. Um, But, but Klein does want to, balance that by saying it's not a destructive exploitation of the earth. Uh, And so he balances that by pointing out that in Genesis 2.15, which we read earlier, uh, that God commanded man not only to um, subdue, kabosh, but here in Genesis 2.15 there's another verb, to work it, to work the ground. And the word work is abad in Hebrew, which means to serve. So it could be translated to serve the ground, uh, which adds another perspective here so that it kind of balances out the word subdue. Okay. Definitely not exploitative. Right. Okay. Yeah, he says there, Klein says on page 69, indeed for man to ravage and poison his world would be to turn it into an unmanageable monster a savage monster that would tyrannize him. Hmm. And obviously that's not what God had in mind for man. So he is to be a good steward of the creation, caring for it at the same time that he is subduing it. And basically I think one way to think about it is cultivating it. That is bringing out all of the riches that are 
potentially there within creation. Mm -hmm. You know, I was kind of thinking about this. This is kind of a funny thought, but I mean, it's really amazing when you think about um, the way humans have gradually advanced in technology over the millennia. And it's, it's incredible to think that we live in a time where man's technological advances have just exponentially skyrocketed just in the past century, you know? Just parabolically, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, motor vehicles, airplanes, uh, nuclear power, all these things happened in the 20th century. And, and you kind of get this feeling, at least I do, that that's somehow bad or part of the fall or maybe not quite right. But if you really think about it, all of those things were potentially there within creation from the beginning. It just took time for man to discover it and then to, to transition from one discovery to the next. I mean, first you have to discover basic things like a wheel, but then, you know, after you just, and fire and things like that. But then after you discover those things, you can develop even more technology to the point where, yeah, you can invent things like airplanes and nuclear power and so on. It's logically inherent within creation itself as God created it. So, mm. I mean, in a way you could say God did intend for man to, it's not just a human. Yeah, of course there are downsides to all these things, nuclear disasters, pollution, etc. but yet the technology itself in principle is not um, some sort of, necessarily it's not necessarily something bad but it's simply bringing out the storehouses and the riches within creation hmm I like that and then Klein says uh, there's a good statement here on page 69 where he says the goal through all of this subduing of the earth was to enhance man's royal majesty and advance man's reign over the earth so the more he develops in technology, the more he is advancing his dominion over the, over the earth. And that then enhances man's royal majesty. And the goal of it all, according to Klein, was not just simply limited to the garden of Eden, but it was to um, achieve ultimate uh, what he calls maximal global mastery. It was to extend the garden to uh, the entire globe. And he says, uh, page 70, the cultural mandate put all the capacity of human brain and brawn to work in a challenging and rewarding world to develop the original paradise home into a universal city. Okay. So this is what we've talked about in previous episodes as megapolis. That's right. Right. This is megapolis. Klein doesn't introduce that term yet. <laughs> uh, that comes in later in Kingdom Prologue, but in but the idea is here. Yeah, the, yeah. I mean, you, you can see the seed of it that um, if Adam is to be developing uh, technologically, and if he's to be subduing everywhere that he goes in the in the cultivating sense. Um, then the entire world would at some point be a Adam's kingdom um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. fit for, for Adam's throne. Yeah. Okay. So as he develops the world that God has placed him in, um, he's there with Eve. So there's necessarily um, human relationship. Mm -hmm. And that means that there's going to be, I mean, I guess we can use the word polity. There really isn't, um, there aren't institutions like the state prior to the fall, like we know now. Right. But, um, but there would be, uh, at least marriage. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, Klein um, really formed my thinking in talking about how 
it wasn't just that a marriage ceremony happened after God created Adam and Eve. I, I guess this might even be parallel to how covenant wasn't something that uh, God made after he had kind of finished creating everything. It it was the way that he created everything. And so mm -hmm. marriage was the environment into which he created Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you do, you still do have sort of a primitive marriage ceremony there, you know, when God uh, brings all the beasts of the field to Adam and, you know, brought, brought them to him to see what he would call them. And uh, there was no helper found for him. So then the Lord God, caused a deep sleep to fall upon him and took out one of his ribs and fashioned the rib into a woman. And it says, and he brought her to the man. That seems like a primitive marriage ceremony there. Um, and then you have Moses's commentary. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. But you're right. I think that there's also an aspect to which um, this is not something added on to creation. This is part of creation itself. The marriage ordinance is a creation ordinance. Mm -hmm. And and it is uh, even, I mean, another point too that, that tightens what you're saying is the fact that marriage is a covenant. Right. And so if, if we accept Klein's premise that the covenant is not an add on to creation, but is part of creation and built into creation, then that ties marriage into creation as well, since marriage is a covenant oh, and then marriage can, can be used later in scripture as a way of describing the covenant between God and his people. That's right. Yeah, it was a, a statement that he made on page 71. Mankind was virtually created a family in that first human, in that the first human pair was created not just male and female, but husband and wife. Mm. Good um, point. Yeah. But, but I don't want to deny what you're picking up on in, in that um, narrative about God bringing Eve to Adam and um, that's helpful. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, if you think about Genesis two being another literary description of what was already narrated back in Genesis one, right? Genesis one says, verse 27, God created man in his own image and the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. So it already mentions male and female, right? Mm -hmm. And then you get to Genesis 2 and you find out that there's a little bit more, it kind of gets focused in a little bit more detail here on what that means, the male and female part. Well, first Adam was created, then Eve was created out of his rib. So that's what it means when it says male and female, he created them. But then that reinforces your point that he created them male and female, or as Klein says, not just male and female, but as husband and wife. Right. Because that second and that second account in Genesis two brings up the husband and wife aspect of it that is only um, hinted at in Genesis one. Mm. Uh, Klein also points out that the word cleave, well, in in my ESV, it's not translated cleave; it's translated hold fast. But uh, in the King James, it's cleave. Men shall leave and cleave, right? Right. <laughs> and uh, but Klein points out that that same verb to cleave or hold fast is used later on in Scripture as a description of the covenant relationship between God and Israel in Deuteronomy ten, verse twenty, and in other places as well, in which um, you know Moses is exhorting the people to to hold fast to the Lord. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve Him and hold fast to Him. And by His name you shall swear. I mean, it makes sense because when Israel ends up being unfaithful, God uses the the antonym for cleave. You know that 
that Israel has been maritally mm-hmm. unfaithful to him. Right. Yeah. And Malachi 2.14 is also relevant here because it uh, uses the word covenant in relationship to marriage. It says, the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. The King James says, the wife of thy covenant. Hmm. And that's that's the version that Klein quotes here. Uh, but however you translate it, there's it's clear that um, you know, in Malachi, the context is literally talking about the the Jews and how they were being unfaithful to their wives. And so um, this helps us to see the idea that marriage is a covenant. And therefore, marriage can be used as a parable for God's covenant with Israel and God's covenant with Adam and Eve as in terms of the covenant of creation. If you recall a couple of, was it last episode or a couple of episodes? I don't remember now. We talked about um, nature parables. Yes. Yeah. And uh, so here Klein comes up with another related concept, which he calls the social parable uh, of marriage. So you've got nature parables to talk about the, the suzerain vassal relationship and the hierarchy of subordination to God. Um, now you also have a social parable, which is marriage itself. Okay. So now uh, that we've got these, these two aspects of the, the two aspects of the cultural mandate, we see that um, they function together. So procreation necessarily has uh, marriage as its appropriate environment. It's an appropriate mm-hmm. venue. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Klein, Klein says that <clears throat> the cultural mandate, going back now to, to that broader issue, which is the topic at hand, the cultural mandate uh, was a family mandate, page 71. And so God was giving the cultural mandate to Adam and Eve as a couple, as a married couple, in order for them to fulfill the cultural mandate as a pair and thereby to populate the human race and to make it the, or to populate the kingdom of God by uh, creating the human race to be the citizens of that kingdom. Okay. And this kingdom... um as it takes its earthly form as Adam and Eve um, exercise mm-hmm. dominion over the earth is going to have some semblance of, of government as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You used the word polity before Klein mm-hmm. uses that word too. And uh, so, yeah, there's some kind of, uh, uh, there are authority structures there here we go. in uh, the pre-fall organization of the kingdom of God. And the, the two main ones are um, the parental authority of the uh, the parent over the child and the marital authority structure of the husband over the wife. And then you could even say there's another structure that kind of blends those two together, which is the family itself. The family is just a combination of both the parental and the marital authority into a larger unit. Okay. And then that, the family structure gets replicated to even larger structures leading to tribes. And so Klein points out that when you get to the redemptive version of all of this in the mosaic economy, uh, you see that one of the main things that Israel is supposed to do or actually that Jacob is supposed to do is to create tribes and uh, it's not just families, but broader units. So it's a tribal family unit as well. Okay. So Klein uses that as a way to try to read back into the pre-fall situation to see what would have happened if Adam had not sinned. 
but yeah, let's go through these these two a little bit more detail here, the parental and the marital. The parental authority structure is um, has two aspects to it, just as we saw with the word subdue being balanced by the word serve. Subdue in Genesis 128, balanced by serve or cultivate in Genesis 215. Klein sees the same thing here with these authority structures. So there's a two-way street here. In the parental authority structure, one aspect of it is the parent's responsibility to care for the child or children. But then that's balanced, on the other hand, by the parent's authority over the child. I, I imagine that in a pre-fall context, there's not, there's not a tension between those two things. Exactly. I mean, there is in post-fall, right? In post-fall, <laughs> it's like the, the authority of the parent becomes unwieldy and pretty soon you start having abusive parents, you know? Right. Um, and the, the caring aspect gets swallowed up by the authority aspect, but that would never have happened pre-fall and uh, vice versa. Children would not have rebelled against their parents' authority. The proper authority of the parent would not be an onerous thing for the child, but the child would take it as um, part of the parent's loving care. Hmm. And true authority is wielded in properly caring for the child, right? Right. So, I'm seeing that as we discuss it. It's just, uh, it's so foreign to the yeah the existence we have. Yeah. <clears throat> But uh, so we can see that same dynamic at work in the marriage relationship as well. Exactly. There's yeah. uh, love and care for and authority mm -hmm. over. And those two things are not contradictory or mm -hmm. in tension with each other. No. But again, after the fall, they do become in tension. And God even mentions that in Genesis 3 verse 16 speaking to the woman, he said, your desire shall be contrary to your husband or shall be uh, for your husband or toward your husband, but he shall rule over you in a, in a way that's not properly exercising authority, but in a way that's tyrannical. And, and um, so you can see how the fall distorts the way things should have been before the fall. Right. But before the fall, the husband's responsibility to care for the wife was a self-sacrificial self love and at the same time balanced by the husband having authority over the wife. And Klein appeals to 1 Corinthians 11 verses 8 and 9 to bring this out. He says, for man was not made for woman, sorry, from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. So Paul is appealing to the creation pattern to, to show that there was an authority structure between the husband and the wife before the fall. Woman was created for man, not vice versa. I know that sounds horribly sexist and patriarchal and all that from in today's culture. It just sounds so shocking to say, but that's what the Bible teaches. Right. Man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. And that's the argument that Paul makes when he talks about authority and roles mm -hmm. within the church. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's not just that he was being arbitrary or sexist or anything like that. He's he's appealing right. to the way God created things. Yeah. So. And you could argue that Paul got that from his reading of Genesis 2. Exactly. You know, he didn't spin it up out of his own head because he was some sort of misogynist or something. He was looking at the text and looking at the way God had intended things from the beginning even before the fall. But again, even though it sounds bad from our point of view, it's actually free, completely free of sin. There's no, there's no sin in even the slightest here. And Adam's authority over his wife was intended to be and 
And until he sinned and abdicated that authority, it was perfectly uh, self-sacrificial and caring and loving and a proper exercise of loving headship and responsible care for his wife. Yeah. I bet we could take a whole episode just on that, but yeah. And, and we could apply it directly to us now as Christian uh, men and Christian marriages and just say, you know, this is the ideal. And even though it's been distorted by sin and even though all of us as husbands and wives fall short in these areas, this is the creation ideal. And hopefully in Christ, we're able to see some degree of restoration of that ideal. Mm. You know, we sin, we fall short, we, we abuse our authority, we lose our temper, we we're controlling and not truly caring for our wives, but it doesn't have to be that way. And we have the Holy Spirit in us to, to help us to be the kind of husbands that God wanted us to be from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Plus when you consider the um, analogy that, that Paul makes there of Christ being the, the bridegroom and the church being the bride, we see how he even treats us in that res in that respect, mm -hmm. he's patient mm -hmm. when, when we fail him, he doesn't just divorce us and move on to right. <laughs> yeah. better people. Right. Right. So, and his whole goal in, in that relationship with us is for our sanctification and for our good and to present us to himself as a bride without spot or wrinkle. And so, in the same way husbands should love and care for their wives, exercising that God-given authority, not for their own selfish ends, as in, hey, go make me a sandwich right now. But, you know, as in, I'm, I want what is best for you. I want you to, to grow in Christ and to, to, um, to be like Christ, just as I am also pursuing that same uh, imitation of Christ in my own life right. as, as a loving husband. So yeah, it's just, it's a beautiful thing. And if only we could figure out how to apply that in our culture today without falling into one of those two extremes of either the extreme of just, you know, totally buying into the culture's view that the sexes are interchangeable and any talk of male authority or male headship is just completely anathema uh, or the other extreme of going into, you know, false ideas and false uh, narratives about what a husband's authority ought to be that verge on abuse and, and that, um, in many cases do lead to abuse and we need to, to look at the creation ideal and then see how that creation ideal is being restored in Christ. Amen. So you've got these authority structures, the, uh, the parent child authority structure, the husband wife authority structure, and then these combine to form the family authority structure. And uh, this leads Klein to a nice little uh, Pado Baptist aside here, <laughs> where he says that this um, uh, idea of parental authority within the context of the family is a constant under the various administrations of the covenant of grace post fall. And so even though there are major differences between the old covenant and the new, uh, this issue of parental authority is one of the things that is the, that is the same, that is a constant. And so he has this great quote on page 73 where he says, throughout the Old and New Testament ages alike, the parental authority principle established in the creational covenant has continued to be honored so that those who own the covenant have the privilege and duty 
of exercising their parental authority to bring their children with them under the institutional rule of their Lord in his covenant. So he doesn't explicitly say, i.e. infant baptism, but that's what he's referring to here. Right. And I mean, I could see this coming when he was talking about the suzerain vassal relationship that, um, whoever is under the authority of the vassal is by extension also mm-hmm. under the authority of the suzerain. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And, and quite literally in these, in these ancient treaties, the vassal is required to uh, bring his own literal children into the proper relationship to the suzerain and to make sure that his children are in submission to the suzerain or not plotting against him and so on and so forth. Yeah. <laughs> I should have queued up uh, what he said in uh, in my Pentateuch class where it, like you use the word aside and he said, and this is why the Presbyterians are right and the Baptists are wrong. Hmm? He just <laughs> kept right on going. <laughs> I like your little mm at the end there. <laughs> That's exactly what you would say. That's exactly it. I remember that though, oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, but then, but I, but I like what he says though. He says that that the the key, the thing that he's focusing on here is this idea of parental authority. I think that's the key angle into this whole issue of the um, the debate between Pado baptists and uh, believers Baptists is that it's the issue of parental authority. Does, does parental authority over the children extend, obviously even Baptists would agree that parents have parental authority just in terms of general discipline. Sure. But does it extend even to the issue of their relationship to the covenant? That's the issue. Mm -hmm. And, and Klein is saying, look, you see this as a constant. You look at every administration of the covenant and you, you see this, you see it pre-fall, you see it in the Abrahamic covenant, you see it in the Mosaic era, you see it in the new covenant uh, you know, in Ephesians 6, when uh, Paul exhorts uh, parents to bring their children up uh, in the fear and admonition of the Lord, and um, he exhorts the parent or the children to obey their parents in the Lord. It's not just obey your parents, but in the Lord. So the, the idea that there is parental authority and that this parental authority extends even to the bringing of our children with us under the institutional rule of the Lord of the covenant um, is it's uh, very clear and it's hard to, to get around it. If you frame it in that way, I mean, there are other ways to try to frame it that can kind of lead in different directions. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, you could uh, point out the issue of um, this issue of Abraham's seed. So a lot of, of uh, Baptists will say uh, the issue of Abraham having an offspring or having a seed is uh, something typological in the old covenant. And so when you look in the new covenant and you see Galatians that we are all Abraham's seed, uh, if we belong to Christ, you see that this idea of the speed, the seed is spiritualized. And so there's a type anti-type relationship between the seed there, but that's true. That's, that is absolutely correct. There is a type anti-type relationship with regard to this issue of Abraham's seed, but the issue is, that the way that Klein is framing this is not by focusing on the issue of the seed or the procreation principle, because he does agree that that's spiritualized, but it's the issue of parental authority. If you frame it that way, then it changes things. And then you can see continuity. Exactly. And you don't, you don't see that principle change um, even when the principle of the covenant changes because here he's talking about the creation covenant, which was a covenant right. of works. Of works, right. And yet, I mean, we see it in the Abrahamic covenant and Klein argues that we even see it in the new covenant. But mm-hmm. uh, I guess the, the reason I'm going there is because even though 
I still, I, I admit I'm struggling to get my mind around what our friend Pascal and uh, my understanding is even like the 1689 um, uh, Federalist folks who mm-hmm. I, I sound like they're saying that the Abrahamic covenant is a covenant of works. Right. If, if I'm understanding them correctly in that, that wouldn't change this because that family authority principle is still operative even there. Right. Yeah. And just to, uh, for some of our listeners who may not know, 1689 federalism refers to the particular brand of covenant theology that's enshrined in the London, London Baptist Confession of 1689. So, Right, and some of the 17th century theologians that were involved in right. crafting that. Right, yeah. And we have nothing but respect for our Reformed Baptist brothers, and we have a lot in common, especially those Reformed Baptist brothers who really are Reformed Baptists and hold to the to the uh, London Baptist Confession uh, in terms of holding to the basic principles of covenant theology, such as the covenant of works and the covenant of uh, redemption and those kinds of things. Um, and they're clear on the gospel and they're clear on the two Adam scheme. Uh, so we have nothing but respect for them, but we do have this difference over how, how do we precisely understand this issue of children in the covenant? And it seems as though our Baptist brothers or reformed Baptist brothers are looking at it from the point of view of Abraham's seed. And that's what gets them into this type anti-type argument, uh, which we actually agree with, but we feel that they're missing this other dimension, which is the issue of parental authority. Mm Mm-hmm. If parental authority is a real thing, and it continues throughout all different administrations of the covenant, pre-fall, post-fall, covenants of works, covenants of grace, then uh, how can we not have this responsibility as parents to bring our children with us into the covenant relationship? Right. We can't just leave them out. We can't say, I have authority over my children when it comes to just, you know, ordinary common grace parenting and teaching them, you know, how to be good citizens and so on. But I don't have authority over them when it comes to their relationship to the covenant. It doesn't make any sense. No, I agree. Especially when you see Ephesians 6, because Ephesians 6 explicitly says that the authority principle continues in the new covenant. It's just really hard to get around Ephesians 6. Right. Um, Addressing children in the Lord. Yeah. So. And, and commanding the, the fathers and the parents to uh, bring up their children within the covenant, to bring them up as professing believers within the covenant of grace, within the new covenant. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. That's the command to the children, but then to the fathers, verse 6, which we could extrapolate to parents. Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. There's the vassal, mm. right, bringing his, his children into the relationship that he has with the suzerain, the Lord. That's, that's a good point. So... We're kind of coming to the end of this section here, but basically Klein is building from one layer to the next. Um, He's got the parental authority structure. He's got the marital authority structure. Then he's built up to one level higher, which is the family structure. And then beyond that to the tribe. And then he gets to the highest level, which is the issue of uh, the patriarchal, headship of Adam over all of humanity. So again, we're still talking pre-fall. We're still envisioning what things would have been like if um, the cultural mandate had continued uh, without a fall. Uh, Presumably even uh, when we're getting to the issue of Adam's confronting of the serpent, let's say he had passed the test uh, and had exercised God's uh, judicial authority upon the serpent, then Adam would have done so as the federal head or patriarchal head of the covenant community. 
So this is on page 73. Client says, a distinctive element in the government of the creator's covenant of works with Adam was the feature of federal representation. Adam, father of all mankind, was patriarchal head of the covenant community in the sense that he acted in a representative capacity for all in his probationary response to the creator's claims and demands. So this is a little different than the authority principle, but it sounds related, right? I mean, as these human creatures are, are growing into a race and a host, Adam has authority over all of them and is mm-hmm. responsible for them in the sense that what he does counts as, mm-hmm. as what they do. Yeah. What do you think about Klein's argument here that Adam would have been a patriarch of the human race or the patriarch, the patriarchal head? (laughs) I mean, I I think that's a helpful way to talk about this federal representation. I I guess maybe that, that word might be why I'm connecting this federal representation with the authority principle. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, because that's how we that's how we understand either patriarchs or matriarchs is you know this venerated mm-hmm. eldest member of the family whose word goes i mean their their word is the final word right yeah so yeah i'm i'm kind of reminded here of um some reading I've done in the work of Charles Hodge in the 19th century when he was debating with um, the new school theologians who rejected the federal headship of Adam and the idea of the imputation of Adam's sin. Mm. And he wrote a lot about this in you know, various journal articles and in his systematic theology. But I think Hodge distinguishes between um, Adam's role in terms of his natural uh, headship as the literal patriarch of the human race coming from him by ordinary generation and the federal headship of Adam. So he distinguishes between patriarchal headship and federal headship or natural headship and federal headship and that the federal headship would have been based upon the natural. Okay. Like the reason God chose Adam to be the federal head is because he's the patriarchal head and the literal progenitor of the human race. But he would, um, Hodge, not Klein, I think Klein would agree with Hodge, but I'm talking about Hodge now. Hodge specifically wanted to distinguish those two concepts, at at least at a conceptual level, and to say that there had to be a specific divine ordination of Adam as the federal head uh, within the covenant, within the covenant of works or the covenant of creation in order to... um, create the possibility then for uh, the imputation of Adam's obedience if he had done that Mm -hmm. or his disobedience, which we know is actually the case. Okay. Is there anything helpful in that regard that we can link to in the show notes? Yes, I think so. Okay. We'll put some of that in the show notes then. So Klein is arguing then kind of going up through these levels from the the, the lowest to the highest, that um, that the polity of the pre-fall covenant community was a theocratic family with Adam as the head patriarch over the family. And he also points out that all members of the creation theocracy were kings and priests unto God, uh, not just Adam, but all members were. And he ties that in with, you know, Exodus 19.6, where God says the same thing about Israel that they are a kingdom of priests uh, to God. Um, Although he does point out one interesting little detail here on page 74, which is that although uh, Adam and all of humanity would have been priests, um, they were not mediatorial priests. Okay. I was going to say something about that. This isn't an atoning... (sighs) A priesthood of you know doing a, a work of atonement, but it's about worship, right? Right. Yeah, 
it's uh, engaging. So Klein distinguishes it between cult and culture. Mm -hmm. The cultic aspect is the priestly role. The cultural aspect is the kingly role. Cult has to do with our vertical relationship with the Lord and uh, culture has to do with our horizontal relationship with other humans and with um, creation. And so he would say that Adam and all of humanity would have been priests in the sense of engaging in that cultic dimension of doing all of their culture with a vertical aspect to it. That is bringing all of their cultural activity as tribute to God and laying it at his feet and honoring God as the Lord of all and consecrating everything to his glory and to his honor, but not as a mediatorial priesthood where a priest stands on behalf of those whom he represents before God and um, atones for sin. That can only happen after the fall. Okay. I guess you could say maybe Adam had something sort of mediatorial just by being a federal head and a representative of the human race. But that's still distinct from the idea of mediation, right? Mm -hmm. Where you have like the Levitical priesthood is a picture of the mediatorial priesthood of Christ. Um, that, that can only happen after the fall. Yeah, so Klein even addresses that here on page 74. He says, in the original sinless situation, there would have been no mediatorial priesthood. Adam had a special representative status in the probation event, but with reference to continuing priestly vocation, Adam's patriarchal status would mean no more than that he was a primus inter pares in the universal royal priesthood of the original holy theocratic family of mankind. The Latin there standing for the first among equals. Yeah. So he's saying that, yes, Adam had a special representative status, but only in the probation event. And then once that was done, if he had passed probation, then his continuing priestly vocation would not have been anything different from, from the others. That is the rest of humanity. Hmm. Wow. All very interesting stuff. Um, I think that's a good place to, to pause for this week. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we're, uh, we're definitely wading into the cultural mandate and we're going to be talking more about, uh, mega polis in the coming weeks, but, uh, that'll be fun. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Well, thank you, Lee. I appreciate the discussion. Yeah. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening this week. Um, you can email us at glorycloudpodcast at gmail.com or you can head on over to the Meredith Klein Facebook group and let us know that you listen to the podcast so we can add you there. And let's continue the discussion. 